This is the moment we all take some rest. Yep. <laughs> We're gonna connect our inner selves. <laughs> we get ready for the journey. Buckle up. Welcome everybody, my name is Stone. I'm a startup entrepreneur. Um, I also happen to be the chairman of Open Knowledge Well. The next 40 minutes I will try to take you through it's a, a bit of a roller coaster ride because normally what I'm going to show you here is something that is in a, a day-long program for, for business professionals. So it's highly shortened. If it goes too fast, pull my sleeve. If you need more explanations, interrupt me. And otherwise I'm just gonna take you on the ride. Enjoy your meals while I uh, kick off. First of all, old way of developing products. I think many of you and even some of the projects here have started that way. There was an idea, some intuition, there's something to be done. In your case, there was a partner that had a business need or a societal need and wanted you to develop something. They did a market study and said, hey, there really is a market for this idea when back into the product. They internally found the funding. Now, if you do a startup or any do good initiative, you will have to find some funding to keep it to keep it going. It can be very minimal, just buying a domain name and some cheap hosting, up to doing marketing and hiring people to do all that stuff. Then you develop the product and the platform. You start doing marketing and communications. It's one of the good things I like about your teams. You all have different skills on team, or that that's at least was the plan. So you have some very technical people, some more business-related people, some marketing, communication people, design people. So that's really important when you do a company. But all that, of course, costs money, and especially if you get out with a plan. Then typically, the first release, you will try to get feedback. This is extremely important, the early feedback of users. I really hope that all of you have something to show. Whenever there's a visitor coming in here, you already show them what you've built and you get your first feedback. I was here last Thursday when the people from the Vlaams uh, Overhead were visiting. They already gave valuable feedback on the first prototypes that they saw, so incorporate that. And then, typically in the next stage, you try to get money from those users because you've created something of value or to partners. And then we will look at different type of revenue models to get that done. What's wrong with this? Go ahead. It's old. It's old. Yeah, well, okay, I sort of <laughs> gave that away. It's old. I mean, I'm old, yeah? We can all change, so that's all very relative. Now, what's wrong with this is that you end up building useless products. Who recognizes this? No hands, which is normal, because this problem was not a big success. It's a necklace with a phone and a watch. Now, <laughs> I see puzzled faces. A necklace with a watch, I mean, if you wear your watch here, it's pretty hard to see time. Uh, and many things were wrong. Yet, a big company, Nokia, thought that was a good idea. So it was like, typically, two-year plan. We're going to do a fancy necklace with different designs. You can have the golden version, the silver version, and so on. But it's set out for a failure, because it didn't speak to end users. Who wants to wear this? It turned out, nobody. And so that's what happened in the old days. As long as you build something, the higher the risk that you will fail. First of all, there's new, new people building maybe something very similar. And because you want to add that extra feature, and because you know you can deliver something even better, you, are, you, are, you have this natural fear to get out. But by not getting out with your project and not getting user feedback from the real end users, you're actually raising the risk of your whole project. And so in the Lean Startup methodology, we, we like to avoid the oh shit moment. And we do this in small bits. And that's ex ex actually is what you're doing. We have, during four weeks, we're developing a product. It's getting better every time. But if you made a mistake, you made an assumption, and it didn't work because the user said, I'm really not interested in, in telling you the profile of uh, what I expect from a, a train ride, and you can't get it out of anybody, then you should probably go back one step and figure out how, what are other ways we could collect this input by not asking it, and for example, that's just one example. And so working in small iterations greatly reduces the, the potential success of your startup and project. Now, this was developed mainly by Steve Blank and, and Brian Cooper, this whole concept where you do customer validation. That's really critical to the Lean Startup methodology. You get out of the building and you speak to people. Who has gone out of the building over the past two and a half weeks? Ah! Way too little people went out. So you are in a great location. You are on top of the Brussels Central Station. You have literally 10,000s of people in holiday modes traveling underneath us here. So all you need to do is get down, get a coffee downstairs, and try to catch some people at a, at, a, at a quiet moment and ask them a simple question that could help your project to know, is there a real interest? 
That's part of this. Make sure you find that product market fit very early on. Afterwards, you can figure out what the business model will be and how you will market it. But it's <coughs> extremely important you get out early and get this feedback. So really, please, after lunch <laughs> and the next few days, start getting out. Not all of you have to do it. You can split up in teams. It's a very uncomfortable thing. It's one of the hardest things to do as an entrepreneur because you fall in love with your solution. By now, almost all of you have fallen in love with the solution. But some of you have forgotten what the problem is that you're trying to solve. And you should actually fall in love with the, with the problem. And then you will find a solution. And so that's a way of putting it. Now, to overcome that fact that we build huge projects that end nowhere, you can do prototyping. And one of the, the, the concepts that has emerged is the minimal viable product, something many of you have heard about and that we're urging you to do. It can start with something very basic, just a big prototype. This was a survey that wanted to check if you have 10 second intros to discover new music, would you like that sort of service? You think this was a, this became a product? You think it might have, could have probably incorporated in other uh, products, you know, this one didn't fly high, it stopped, but at least they tested it. And they just took a piece of paper and they looked, how do people interact if I give them this piece of paper and I tell them, what music do you want to listen to? We just push the play button like anybody would if you see this interface. And then you have a phone on the background, you just put on, you give them a headset and you put on the music. You don't need to build anything for that. So that's a middle of IR product. You're testing, is anybody interested in this? And then you have to figure out, can you build this into a viable, a product that brings value and that people will be willing to pay for? Uh, a famous example is Zappos. Who has heard about Zappos? No, not many people here, some of you do. So it was bought by Amazon. It's actually the biggest shoe retailer online in the US. And the founder of that company, besides being extremely focused on customer service very early on, when it wasn't that fashionable yet uh, as it is today in online, um, to build that business in the old days, he would have gone out, buy shoes, inventory, build an e-commerce website, find a vendor, find developers, do all that, do marketing, get his logistics um, up and running, then do the marketing campaign to get customers to find out that a lot of people send their shoes back. And what he's doing instead? He just took pictures in the shops around his home, where the city where he was living, and he would put them on a simple website. And if you like him, you could email him, and he would go out to that shop, buy those shoes in your size, ship them to you, and get feedback. Get shoes sent back, try to send them back to the store, which wouldn't accept them. But he, he would get a percentage how happy are people and validate, do people buy shoes online? Which a decade ago was a weird idea that you couldn't try them. And it turns out that people buy, who's bought shoes online? Ta-da, about half the room here has bought shoes online. So, interesting concept of an MVP. So do you wanna buy it? The, you, you can test this and you can also test uh, the, the price sensitivity. How much do you add? You take your most popular pair of shoes, you double the price. You see how many of them do you sell? If you keep selling them, you, you have a nice margin. If you see that you can't sell them at the retail price, you'll need to find huge volumes to get a, to buy them at a lower price, and the retail shops can can uh, can buy them. It's all about iterations. So the build, measure, learn cycle is one way to look at it. You've built something in the first week, you've tested it, and you've measured how users went with that or how many, uh, for the ones that are scraping the open parkings and the parking usage in Belgium and the Flanders, you can measure what can we take in, is it once a second or one a minute that we need to check this? And then you learn from that. How often are they down? How many people come to our website? Stuff like that. Another, another approach for that is the other way around. Oh, this is already, by doing this, <coughs> you can find out when you do the learn part that you did something wrong. I will show you, um, Famous example, who knows this website? Nobody does, it's perfectly normal. First of all, you're way too young to know this. And secondly, it was a, uh, a dating website which introduced a little feature which was video. We find it very normal now, I see three cameras pointing at me here. We find it very normal to stream video and to record videos. Back then it was not. You can see by the, the type of the page, it was uh, quite a while ago. But this became YouTube. This was a company with a dating website that added a feature video 
and it found out that the video feature was extremely popular and used by people for many other things and just for, for presenting themselves. And so they turned that dating company into a, a web streaming, well, back then it wasn't streaming as a web hosting and video uploading and downloading stuff. User generated content. So that's the genesis of YouTube was something completely different. And there are many companies that started out by doing great MVPs, and eh? we all know Tesla now. They didn't go out and build a factory to buy chassis of cars. They just went to a Lotus car, which was available, and they fitted batteries in it. And they, they checked two people buy a battery-powered car with a low ridge, and then it evolved into a real product. And then it evolved into a product with all sorts of annex services, a supercharger network, which overcomes your long, uh, uh, the, the, the short range of your battery. You can overcome that by building a supercharger network. Or you can build home batteries. So if you have a, uh, the solar panels, you can store that energy in excess of what you use in your car. So that's an example of a company uh, really innovating a lot. This is a famous quote, of course. And failure is, a, is, a, is an option here. If things are not failing, you're not innovating fast enough and hard enough. It's a, it's a bit of a cliche, uh, but many of you will maybe feel that way now. And this is really not, nothing to be ashamed of. You've built stuff, you've learned stuff, and you, the next version will be better than the current one. So that's really one of the things. Huh? The hard part is to get out of your comfort zone. We all want to stay sitting around the table developing stuff, uh, imagining all sorts of interesting uh, marketing campaigns, uh, graphics, and so on. But the real thing is to get out of your own comfort zone and learn new things. For example, by going to talk to those uh, customers. So when you do a customer interview, and I will really, this, this is like, full day if you want to get people to do good interviews for the day. So this is something I'm going to do in one minute, but know who to talk to. For the ones doing public transport solutions, you are in the central station on a hub of a, a train and a metro. You can do a lot of things just here. So go out, talk to people, ask questions. It feels very unnatural. The first day, first time is like I'm a little bit harassing somebody who isn't waiting for me to stop them and ask questions, but it's extremely uh, useful for your project. Focus on the riskiest assumption. For any of your projects, like why will it not be used? Or why would people use it? Or what are the other ways people do it? The number of startups that come to me and say, ah, we found people, they do this in Excel every month. Okay, they do it in Excel. They found a way to overcome the business problem by doing it in Excel. It is not automatically because you can do it in Excel and you could build a beautiful uh, web platform to do the same thing, that they will move to your solution. So these are often uh, false promises, it's like you, you say, okay, a lot of people we saw are doing this, uh, this, this very tedious task every month in Excel. It's not a reason that they will come to your web platform. So just make sure, if that is your assumption, you have to test, find somebody who is doing it today in Excel, what does it take them to do it in your platform? And if it takes one hour or one day to upload the data in your platform, and it takes 10 minutes in Excel, it's a huge hurdle to move to your platform. And this is often overlooked when you do online. Have the interviews, document them, because you want to measure and learn and debrief within your team, because you will find out that many of you have the same thing. One of the typical hard starters when you want to do such an interview is how do you present yourself? So I can say, hi, I'm Tom, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm trying to understand my customer's market, and you seem to be a, a public transport user. So have you ever experienced the fact that your train was full, was dirty, was late? never happens, but some people apparently have had this experience. Can you tell me the last time this happened? This is very important. If, you ask, if I would ask all of you, how many movies do you want to see the rest of the year? You're going to give me, a, I'm going to ask in a movie theater, not the Netflix ones, just in a movie theater. You're going to give me a number, which is an aspiring number. Oh, I really would like to go twice a month, so um, let's say 24 a year, half year is done, and so on. If I ask you, how many movies did you see the last month or the last six months? It's a much more trustworthy number because it's about what you really did and not what you aspire or think you did. So if you ask questions, try to ask questions about the past, not about what they might be doing in the future or what they think they will do. Use a topic map, especially if you're alone in the interview. I, I urge you to go with two persons, one person who asks the questions and one person who takes the notes. But if you're alone, it helps to have like the five topics you want to ask was it, the, and let's go back to the trains, was it on time? Mm -hmm. What do I find important? Does it need to be clean? Do I want to have a lot of uh, step overs or not direct lines? You, you put your subject in there, 
And when you go over to an interview, you know I've already treated this and that, but that way it is not a list where you have to ask the person on the other side, could you answer question one, two, three? You can do it in a more organic way. And please behave like a child. Why, 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 why? At the third why, you start getting good answers. At the fifth why, you're probably go gonna discover new things that you haven't imagined for yourself. So, this is really something we forget. We've been learned not to ask it anymore when we grow up. But it's very useful for when you do an interview. Why do you do it this way? And if you do that way, why do you do it that way? And if you do that, why have you always done it that way? And what are the other ways you could be doing this? And that helps you to, to further elaborate on your project. Now, this is the part where it gets really warm. <laughs> This is not something you're going to read. It's an old school business plan written to explain how a certain startup, in this case it was a couple wise, stepping the wisdom of the best experts and the wisest couples. It doesn't, it's not important what this was about. It's what is important to see is that you don't want to read this. It's too much text. And all of you are in a project. Within a week and a half, you're going to be pitching this to other people. And they want to understand that you that you understand, first of all, your project yourself, that you can explain what it brings to them, but also how it's going to be viable, how it will continue after this, this, uh, this experience of Open Summer of Code is over. And so one of the things to do that used to be a business plan. You would write a business plan, right? Who has had business plans in their curriculum? In school, university, a few hands. Oh. Yeah, oh, they still teach that. I've been writing a lot of business plans and I have always managed to get the costs about right. But the, the revenues were always far below what I projected. This is, it's very easy to make a nice spreadsheet <laughs> and you grow X percent per month and it like goes through the roof and you try to get the hockey stick in there. Yeah? So like, wow, my startup is going to go really through the roof and we're going to make a lot of money by doing this with that. But it's very hard to get there. And so when you do uh, a business plan, you make a lot of assumptions, but they're all really rough assumptions. Your guess is often as good as mine. And so to overcome the problem of business plans that nobody reads, um, the business model uh, canvas was, uh, and business model generation as a concept, was, was introduced by uh, Alex uh, Osterwell. And this is like a new way of uh, defining your project and your plan. And this is something I, I'm going to try and we'll see with Dries for this afternoon. <laughs> I uh, will get you printed copies because I think it's really useful for each of the teams by next week to at least have run through this with your team to see how can your project be viable. And if you look at the business model canvas, it starts on the right. Now, again, in Dutch we say it's a, a capstock. It's just a framework. It is something <coughs> to structure your thoughts and your project. It is not uh, your Bible. It's not something to be taken literally. It's something to discuss around. But it helps you to very quickly convey your project to other people. And so it starts with the customers or the users. You read it from right to left. And you have a certain value proposition. Yeah? Each of you is building something that is going to bring value to somebody somewhere. Yeah? So you define your value proposition. You try to figure out who are the customers and users for your value proposition. You will relate with them in a certain way. And you will deliver your solution. It can be an API. It can be a website. It could be emails. Could be very practical things you do for them. Uh, I'm thinking about the dementia project. Uh, uh, can be an approach. The different ways, uh, uh, counseling, coaching, stuff like that. That's one side. So value proposition, customer users, how you interact with them. The other side is like, how will you get there? What do you need to do to make that? For example, uh, you need to build a website. Well, that's an activity. What is the resource you need? You'll need some hosting. You'll need developers. Uh, many of them in the room that know how to get that website up. You need partners. If you're going to do stuff with trains, it's maybe useful to have the train company on board or the, the, the subway company on board for public transport as a key partner. They might uh, help you reach out to the right users to get uh, on board. If you do parking tracking, you might want to have the GPS companies on board so that you can say, hey, I have real-time parking availability in cities now. Maybe it's useful to reduce the people driving around and polluting for nothing, that we indicate them to the nearest parking that's available and, in, and, and even show them the, the price of that. So that's the, the top part. Then on the left here is the costs. What are the costs you need to pay for those resources and potentially maybe even for some of those partnerships? Not all of them are free. And secondly, uh, what is the revenue model? Yeah, 
they're very interesting revenue models, even in open source, uh, even if you think about uh, Wikipedia. They ask for contributions, which is not a license fee, which is not just like a donation. So there's a revenue model of users that once a year get this nice little pop-up asking like, hey, please chip in, you've been using us a lot over the last 11 months. This is the month that we ask you to, to, to help us fund to uh, actually cover the costs of running as I said earlier, the relationship part, which was on top, can be a lot of things. It's, it's often one of the hard ones to fill in. So it can be a personal assistant. Yeah? Uh, it can be dedicated personal assistant. It can be a self-service model, where you just say, you have to come to my site, and you will have to find out, like, it's an on-demand platform using your self-service. It can be automating services. It can be a community, or even something that you co-create with others. So there's many options in the relationship between your value proposition and your uh, customers and users. And secondly, there's a revenue part. Again, here, I, I, many of you will have to be a little bit creative because you are not selling the typical commercial solutions. You're using open data, open source. You're trying to make a societal impact. And so you might have to look at, can we find a usage fee for people that really like our uh, solution? Or can we do something freemium? For example, in, in two of my startups that use open data, the search engine is free, everybody can use it, but when, as a professional you start using it every day, we have advanced features for which we make you pay. So you sort of marry the fact that you put in a lot of effort in consolidating sources and offering a solution, but you get paid by the premium users that, have, that make money with your tool because they do something more efficient than they would use. And the occasional user can still get everything for free. Subscription fees, you could lend, rent, lease it, uh, there's a licensing part, maybe that you can do a white label version of your tool for the ones doing the, the parkings and you say it's going to be free in Flanders, in Belgium, in Brussels, but if uh, Berlin wants to have the same thing, we can license our platform to you and we will use that money to pay for a DevOps uh, all year long to maintain the platform and do like uh, small incremental uh, feature improvements on the platform. That's another way you can ship your solution. Uh, you can have brokerage fees. If you would be selling uh, train tickets, you could get a commission on that. You broke your tickets, yeah? So you could, with that commission, you could uh, fuel your, uh, the, the cost of your platform. And then, back in the day, advertising used to be in almost all the business plans and all the revenue models of startups. Uh, it becomes very hard to make money with advertising. So the cost per thousand impressions has gone really down. If you want to make money in advertising, it needs to be extremely segmented, and then you get into privacy issues, because you, the, the counterparty will want to know a lot about the people you're going to show the ad to with whom you will look them up. So this is something to take into mind. I said, this is a very short, condensed session. We could talk about a lot more things uh, later on. But this is the business model canvas. Now, I have a, a secret theory that this was actually uh, developed for 3M who does those post-its. Because literally millions of post-its are being sold all over the world to hang on uh, the uh, business model canvas. Um, it's something that's alive, so you have an assumption. Maybe in your team somebody says, oh, these are, uh, we have like three customer segments. You can use a different color. So imagine that you say, we have uh, free users and we have paying partners, and we consider both of them uh, customers, uh, although there's a strict definition that the customer typically is the one who pays, but you can put them in there too. Um, then what you will do is that you can use the same uh, color, for example, I take a yellow post-it for the freemium users, and the value proposition is they can do basic search. And then I can do one for the professional users, and I can say they have advanced filters. And that way, when you read the plan, you can simply see how the value proposition is different for a certain type of customer segments. Same with the partners. Maybe you need a different partner for the free users and for the professional users. So that's that's one way to to further fill in. Now we'll, we'll, we'll quickly go to one example to make it a little bit more uh, lively. This one has flipped, and I said again, it's only a framework. They flipped uh, left to right, so the customers are on the left. It's uh, somebody who found customers very important, so some of them flip it around. So this is a service, by just looking at this, you don't need to re read to 50 pages. You will discover that this is about a reading spot. I hope everybody can, can see it. It's, it helps if you, if you can draw it, it becomes even more visual with this model canvas. Um, the idea behind this project was 
busy frequent travelers who want a quiet moment, and especially busy parents who like reading and travel with their, with their children. Now, when I see this, first of all, I see a huge uh, problem, because those are very different markets. Business travelers typically don't travel with their children, and they don't have the time to mix the two on a tight schedule. But this was a proposition, so uh, any, any idea is good and should be tested. So let's give it the benefit of the doubt. So what were they going to do? They were going to find a location in an airport where you would have books and where you could read in silence to your child while you're waiting for the, the, the boarding to start. Nice idea. So what is the relationship they have with those customers? It's personal assistance. You're helping something with, uh, somebody with them. You co-create, because people are reading and, and you're also co-creating with, with, uh, with other third parties. The channel is very indirect. You have lounges. So you, have a, you need to find airport lounges where you can set this up. You could hook up with libraries who might want to exchange books or want to further uh, expand their services into frequent travelers. You could make a nice, uh, I would say, partnership with Amazon and others to like have the book in the library. But if you want to continue it, you can order it so that your holiday location is uh, it's already there by the time you arrive at the hotel or the, the Airbnb. And you could have all sorts of data services. And again, privacy-wise, watch out with, with doing those. But knowing who reads which books to your children, you might want to have. Uh, are they are they uh, in, into like uh, Grimm uh, uh, stories by the Brothers Grimm, or are they reading like a more uh, graphic type of? Uh, 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 and so, on. so that that's the, the what are the key activities they need to do? Well, they will of course need to have this space in the airports. That, that needs to be comfortable, they need to be able to customize it, people need to, need to socialize it with their children and maybe with other parents. And the resources they, they need is that they need, and they need to get books, they need to get curators that, uh, that, that decide which book would be very good to read in an airport, maybe have very short ones, if you have half an hour that you can read the whole book in half an hour. They would need appropriate furniture, and they would have people that are there to, to, to help you and cater around. So quite a, if I see this, quite an expensive uh, thing to set up and the partners for them would be all those frequent flyer uh, programs but then also coffee providers maybe and the local libraries we already uh, mentioned in the, in, the, in the channels and the auxiliary service providers that offer all sorts of extra things around them and the pillows and uh, uh, so costs are clear they're linked to the resources the revenues they had in mind uh, we're doing upselling, complementary goods. Now that's already far-fetched. And you're giving somebody a nice experience, they need to buy stuff to, uh, to do that. They thought about advertising. They were hoping for authors and speakers to show up. And again, when I see this, you can punch a lot of holes in those assumptions. Yeah? And so you would, if this would be your company, you would have to go out and see with the, with, the, with the author, would you be interested to come to this airport and there might be people showing up with children and they might be interested in the type of books you create seems like a far-fetched assumption to me but who knows maybe you find them and so they would have a tiered membership fees you can be club member premium member vip member i'm not sure if you want to do the family thing but that's a good idea to start this uh, distantiating between those uh, classes in there but then again uh, who knows maybe i miss something this, this. do you think this happens no no not many enthusiasm in the room um, on the other hand, I didn't time it, but I think that within less than five minutes, I managed to run the whole idea, which is not mine, which I just imagined by, by looking at this. Yeah? And each of you can do the same thing with your projects. And then <coughs> when you have visitors coming over or project partners, they will ask you questions like, yeah, but what complementary goods do you, what do you mean by that? Or uh, how much do you think you can, how many revenues would you, would you actually get from that? Or uh, yeah, but uh, those curators, where will you find them, or what do you need to do? Do you only need one, or do you need one for every language and stuff like that? And so, again, this is a framework. It helps you to discuss, and it's something that's alive. So you imagine Sky Team and Star Alliance as partners. Maybe you've come back at uh, uh, Sky Team, and they will tell you we're working on something very similar internally. No, thank you. We can't share any information. That means you can take them from your list. You can also take it as a validation. Wow, they're working on something very similar. My idea must be really uh, worth something. If other people are trying to endeavor the same uh, uh, crazy uh, idea than the one I'm trying to, to realize. Yeah. So that's typically what you can do with a business model canvas. I'll give you a second one because that's what they usually look like. They're not that well uh, drawn up. Uh, here we have an old one for Twitter. 
So they had users, they had uh, companies, and they had developers. Um, this is um, a word of warning. When you build APIs on third of closed silos, and Twitter is a closed proprietary silo. In the early days of Twitter, I knew lots of developers who built tools on top of Twitter, and Twitter was very happy about it because they developed through that IT geeky community at first. And so developers were making useful tools on top of it. But then at some point, and the same has happened to LinkedIn, the same has happened to Facebook, the, the silo, when they see that others make revenues on core features, they will say, oh, the archive feature, I don't like others to do that. It's our, I mean, it's in our silo. We're gonna pull that out. We don't allow you to do that. Oh, you're selling our data to your API. No, no, we don't want that. We make an exclusive partnership with these two APIs. And anybody who wants to like suck up the full uh, Twitter feed, you need, you need to pay those, uh, those uh, I would say, uh, partners that do the, the API uh, feed. So, word of warning, if you build on top of a closed system that is commercially driven, if you are very successful, your exit is only that platform, or they shut you down and build it themselves and copy you. Yeah? So that's a bad position to be in. And, and I've, I've literally known teams of developers who had shut down their company or that day because they weren't aware enough of this, uh, this, this uh, I would say, weakness in their, in their business model that they depended so much on the third party platform that you could just pull the plug on their assets. And again, uh, which channels do they use? Website, apps, mobile, and in the early days, a lot of SMS, and then the API. What was the value proposition? You can discuss this, uh, you can stay connected with your friends like any uh, social uh, media network. You could follow news and events, especially as soon as the hashtag emerged, and you could easily follow that sort of thing. Uh, you, could, you will see by sponsors, you could do very targeted marketing by finding out who tweets about what, Marketeers can find out what you like, and so they can segment you, and, and uh, the Twitter platform can pull up those ads that are relevant to you. And then they had Twitter apps, third parties building all sorts of stuff on top of the platform. Their key activity was platform development. In the early days, there was this uh, fail wheel that came up. The platform was growing so fast that often they went down due to capacity issues, uh, and so they needed to put in a lot of uh, uh, human uh, uh, developers and DevOps and infrastructure investments to make sure that the, it will stay up at all times. They had some partners, I will go very quickly over this one. Cost structure mainly employees and servers and the revenue streams, there were many of them uh, going from promoted accounts. You, you can promote to get more uh, followers, uh, promoted tweets, uh, selling off detailed analytics either to the end users, the companies or third parties. The licensing your data streams is a really big one. Um, if you look at customer service, many people want to reach out uh, to, a, to a company. They will not go to find the email. Uh, they will just shout online and put the, the Twitter handle of a brand in there. And then they expect the brand to react. And there's lots of uh, apps that were built on top of those streams to make sure if somebody shouts out, if you take the NMBS as in here, they actually, if you shout at them, they will like, they have a whole team of people that will react to you and they will say, I'm very sorry your train is late. Uh, let's, let's see if we can uh, uh, suggest you an alternative or uh, something. Anybody ever use that feature? Yeah, you did. One, two, three, four, five, six people. So they are reactive, but this, is, this, this, this also shows a very weird situation. I know people at a, at a, at a commercial uh, air company they tell us that the frequent flyers, if they want to redeem points and get extra, they need to call a VIP call center. They say, I, I'm a, this uh, diamond ambassador level or lifetime. I would like a free upgrade or I would like a connection being flight in London. And you would have to say, I enter the, call, the old application. I'm very sorry, we can't do that. You don't qualify. You need another zillion miles to qualify for that goodbye. And then you have the backpacker who has a nice Instagram account. And that person tweet like, oh, this sucks. I'm stuck in Brussels and I really wanted to go to London. Yeah, and then the social media team picks up there. Ooh, this person has 100,000 followers. We're going to give a free ticket. And they send somebody over with a glass of champagne. And this person says, I'm so happy. Brussels Airlines just upgraded me to first class to fly to London. And so you have this super service to social media because it depends straight from the CEO. He says, like, this is like a corporate, very important for our image. And then on the other hand, that side, you have the classic old way where they've set up call centers for frequent flyers who actually get less service than the ones shouting with the, with the, with the big megaphone on, on the social media. So the ones of you with a great following, you can actually trade that in for extra service. <laughs> Let's move on. Um, as said, it is only a, uh, a, a scheme 
to structure your thoughts. And so there are alternative versions. This is the Lean Canvas by Ash Murray, uh, who is actually focusing more on the, the, the product. And so the, the left side of this scheme is product, and the right side is focused on the market. And so there's a lot about the problem, solution, and the metrics you have with. That's very close to the MVP we were talking about. You're going to have to describe the problem you're solving, the solution you're solving it with, and then the metrics of how you will actually measure both your critical assumptions and your success afterwards to see what is the interaction you I will, I will, uh, I will not dive further in, d dive further into this one. So, as said, this was a very short introduction to the lean startup methodology, which is all about doing, using the least efforts possible to get the greatest and the farthest you can. And so by finding the riskiest assumption in your project and to mimic that, to find what can I do not to build my whole platform for a month, but to test in the first week, would this work, would this fly, would people use this? Yeah. Uh, second part, business model canvas, one page, you use post-its, you put those different elements on there, you discuss about them and your project evolves. And this is, so this is officially something we want in deliverable by next Thursday, right? Yeah, <laughs> woohoo, lots of enthusiasm here, I can see that. I ran you all through so fast that we have five minutes left for Q&A. So, first of all, thank you for your attention. Second, go ahead, shoot. Any, any question, go ahead. Hopefully we find um, that traditional companies actually adopt these new ways of uh, doing their business. Companies that they used to do it always like this. Yeah. So it's how does this new, new way of doing things? How it's extremely hard. So I think you're all very fortunate because first of all, you haven't been mistrained yet. You're all young. You're starting out. So please do not go the old way. Yeah. Uh, so that's one thing. Secondly, it's very hard for companies to change because the reason they structure that way is often they operate in a certain way. They have a certain process that was come to a certain maturity and everybody is trained in that process. And of course, once you have a, once you, once you're no longer a starter, that means you found your business model, you found your product market fit, you know how to operate, how to reach new users, how to keep them happy. You no longer need all of this uh, very short stuff because you, you're doing something from, for the long term. And you should, should be very conscious about the fact that many companies, they should not try to do this in their massive scale of operations, they should do it for smaller projects and to small iterations of a, of a part of it. But if, if, if I take uh, the train company, if they, if every uh, train conductor would start in the morning and say, like, ah, I wake up, I'm doing my uh, a business model canvas today and I'm gonna try a different value proposition. I'm no longer going to take people, I'm gonna take animals. I'm gonna stop in the middle of a field, open my doors and see if they come in. Yeah. Of course that wouldn't work. So that's you, at some point you need to decide what you want to innovate and, 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 and how, how you do that. And so for large companies, it's very hard to do that because they operate and have a, often have a cash cow. And it's a nice thing to the cow that didn't want to onboard on the train, but they do have cash cows. And they typically run in a process. And when you do something new, you don't have a process yet. And so you want to avoid all the overhead of a hard process, but you do want to validate if we build this product or solution, do we have enough of interest, of traction, of people willing to, to pay for it or enough of value to, to, to build it. And so the hard part is to get people out of that man mindset of the process and to get them in the mindset out of the comfort zone. Like nothing is cast in stone and today each of you can stop your project the way you're doing it and make a pivot to something else. From the dating website we saw to YouTube, from using an existing car fitting up with batteries to a full-blown uh, car model. And so it's very hard uh, for companies to innovate because they typically have this current focus and the innovation often comes from outside. That's, that's often referred to as uh, creative destruction. So the, it's, it's very hard for them to innovate. So one of, the, one of the things companies do, they do, they do boot camps, they do all sorts of, uh, I would say, interactive formulas where they take teams, or they mix teams internally, externally, or they ask companies like the one I uh, used these slides from, Institute, to help them to have a hackathon, and you're, in, you're actually in a, in a four week hackathon program where every week you have an iteration, you have coaches that help you on the different uh, problems you're encountering. And so that's one of the ways companies try to innovate is by taking it out of the core process, doing something on the side, and if it gets good enough, they hope that they can 
uh, either hook it up as a wagon on the on the main uh, uh, locomotive or the other way around that your existing business will fade but this new business is already in place to take over but it's a it's a hard juggle for companies to combine the existing business and to innovate on the side and it's something that needs to be really in the company DNA they need to do it they need to want to do it from the inside but it often also asks a different mindset of the people working there and doing that because they were not hired to be creative innovative to disrupt the company they were hired to operate and excel in, in delivering extremely good customer service or by computing data in a, in a very efficient way. Does that answer your question? Yeah. More questions? Practical questions? Otherwise, I'm going to ask questions. So, what was, what was the hardest thing you had to solve today? Nobody did anything hard. It was so easy. <laughs> Nothing hard. Very quiet. Israel? You had a hard thing to solve, apparently. <laughs> At least these things you solve something very hard. Safety, you mean application safety or the mm -hmm. end user safety? We were actually planning to fix the application and then we were to some Okay, so, so it was physical safety yeah. of the test device. Okay. Good. And what was the solution you found? You're going to chain them up or was uh, I'm very curious? Uh -huh. So you found a solution. You let them use their own mobile phone. So that's one less uh, uh, trouble to, to figure out. And, and it's, it's interesting what you say. You're going out and end users will test. This is another thing that a startup entrepreneur doesn't want to do. You typically, you know you can build a better version, so you don't want to get out too early. But ideas are cheap, and often it's not the idea that matters. And all of you have uh, onboarded on a project of around a certain idea. But you have developed it, and you will continue to develop it over the next few uh, days. Uh, and so the fact that you're going to get users to install your app to test it, to me, is already a, a, a great success, because it means you're going to get this very valuable customer feedback. And that's, at least I hope that's what you're going to get, right? You're going to observe what they do, or you're going to measure what they do? So you're going to do customer interviews. <coughs> OK, very good. Who else is at the stage of doing customer interviews? After everything you heard, I should see all the hands going up. <laughs> yeah. Ooh. They are, but they're not telling us. They're not telling you. Aha. Uh -huh. So we're going to give you. Uh, sorry? They all are. <laughs> yeah. Some enthusiasm. We did like the focus group yesterday. So, focus group, very good too. Yeah, just. And what, what were they using today that could be a replacement for what you do? Like the search function in, in the PDF file to look up the skills, and we are actually making now a form where you can search for the skills. So. Okay. So people use search in PDF forms. Wow. That sounds like an easy one to overcome, but <laughs> I don't know if everybody knows it. But it's a nice one. But what, what else? What, what else did you did you learn by the focus group? Um, like we, we thought that um, the interface you made, like the mockup, was uh, too like it was an easy one to build. But we all also had another idea, like more navigation uh, in there. But then they made clear that this was maybe too uh, difficult for them because they made you only use it once and then. We Okay. So that would not be necessary to have. Okay. okay, so that's a. They can put a lot of effort into it. We'll keep that as a last word of advice, but it applies to all the teams. And they got very good feedback. They built something. I know a little bit about the project. That's a B-Batch project. 
And so they want people to create their skill badges and they want to have beautiful skill badges. So they have a template engine on which you can uh, add your own stuff and then build your badge and then upload it to a database so others can reuse it. And so if you do this task only once and you need to read a manual and watch five instruction videos and look at the tooltips all the time that you're trying to figure out, you're probably not going to succeed because after two minutes people will already uh, skip to do another task. And so I think it's very important, that's what I, what I understand, you keep the simple interface where in an intuitive way people will start using it. And that's, that's actually when you have a, uh, when you're going to measure this afternoon how people interact, if you don't need to explain anything and they use it, you've, 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 you've hit gold, I would say, because it means you don't need a manual. If you need a manual, a lot of explanations, or you see everybody doing the wrong thing to you, that means that the natural thing is to go to the to this certain button that you only want to be used for advanced configuration settings, and they all start by using that button, it means that in your, your, your user interface, you will need to change something to adapt to the behavior of the user. Yeah. So with that, I would uh, like to thank you all for your attention. And especially, I wish you all a lot of luck and uh, uh, I would say a lot of successes by doing those customer interviews <laughs> to further improve your projects. And I look forward to the end result next Thursday. Yeah? So all the best to you and thanks a lot. And I'm, I'm staying around a little bit. So if you have more questions that you didn't ask in public, feel free to, uh, to come to me in person.